Thank you. Uh, good morning. It's great to be here this morning in Berlin. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Catherine Daniels, and I'm going to talk to you today about how DevOps is dead. Uh, to start out, I'm going to give you a bit of background information about me so you kind of know who I am and where I'm coming from when I say this. I started out playing with computers from a very young age. Um, I went to university to study computer science because somehow I was still into computers after an ill-fated attempt to teach me C when I was about five years old. Shockingly, that didn't work too well, but here I am. I thought I wanted to be a developer at that point. And outside of running a couple media servers at home, I didn't even know that operations was even a thing that you could do. After that, I did R&D for workstation graphics for Hewlett Packard for a few years. I got to do fun things like play with really expensive graphics cards and see monitors do things that they shouldn't actually be able to do. I didn't get to play any Halo 3, but I did get to play several other video games in the name of testing and debugging, which was fun. It was, you know, a big corporation, though. Um, DevOps wasn't even invented back then, and even if it had been, a company like that, there's too many different teams, too many silos to really even count. So after a few years of that, I moved to New York and accidentally became a system administrator. You know how it goes, uh, you're working for a small startup doing development, QA kind of stuff, and the one sysadmin quits. And somebody had to keep the data center from burning to the ground, and that somebody happened to be me. So I did operations for a couple years at a couple different startups, learned a lot, had a lot of fun. But at those places, operations was very segregated. It was kept separate from the rest of the company. At one point, my coworkers, I think, thought I quit because there were two months when I just went straight to the data center instead of ever coming into the office. Even at places that supposedly did DevOps, the operations part of it was still kept separate from everything else, and I really didn't like that too much. I spent a few months with the job title of DevOps engineer, which the internet tells me has something to do with cats and computer hardware, but for reasons that I'll get into later, I didn't like that title very much, so it didn't stick around for very long. So currently, I am an operations engineer at a company called Game Changer. We do scoring, statistics, and community management for amateur sports, primarily baseball and basketball. We're about 30 head people uh, headquartered in New York City. It's also a very small shop, but I'm not segregated away from them anymore. I work very closely with the developers, with all of the engineers, and because we're entirely in AWS, there isn't even a data center to banish me to. So that's who I am kind of an operations background. So why am I up here saying that DevOps is dead? That's a pretty bold statement to make. If DevOps were dead, nobody would be talking about it. Nobody would have asked me to come here and talk about it. So to explain what I mean by this, I'm going to talk about something called the hype cycle. This was developed by the IT research firm Gartner to describe how various technologies are adopted, how they mature over time. I'm going to be using a version of this that's a little more generalized, but the same basic principles apply. So the hype cycle for a technology or an idea starts with the trigger. At this point, an idea is usually just a potential breakthrough, but it hasn't been proven yet. For software or hardware, this could mean that there's maybe only an alpha product, but not something that you can really put into the hands of customers and have them use. For an idea, like the idea of DevOps, Somebody just thought of it, and it's just starting to come to life. So for DevOps, this trigger was sometime back in 2009. The first DevOps Days event was held in Belgium in, I believe, October of that year. And this was the year that DevOps as a term was first coined. At this point, nobody had heard of it, nobody had thought of it before, and this really was the first conference of, it, of its kind that brought developers and operations together. Patrick Dubois, the organizer of DevOps Days, said in a blog post that he wrote after this first DevOps Days event, he said, I'll be honest, for the past few years when I went to some of the Agile conferences, it felt kind of like preaching in the desert. 
I was kind of giving up. Maybe the idea was too crazy, developers and ops working together. But now, oh boy, the fire is really spreading. And back then, it really was kind of a crazy idea. Back then, this was not just an internet meme. It was kind of the way things were. Developers saw sysadmins as stuck in their ways. You know, grouchy, curmudgeonly, the so-called bastard operators from hell that hated change and would never let anyone get anything done or touch their precious servers. Sysadmins saw developers as reckless and irresponsible, people who would write code and probably not bother to test it before throwing it over the wall, putting it in production, and making the ops people figure out how to run it and maintain it. So what was this newfangled DevOps idea, and how could it help? Patrick said, to tackle the problem, DevOps encourages cross-cycle collaboration constantly, not only when things fail. I'm sure most of us are familiar with these stories of failure when something goes catastrophically wrong, and that's the only time that developers and sysadmins are brought into a room together. But it's not exactly the fun kind of working together. It's people pointing fingers and yelling and throwing each other under the metaphorical bus, trying to figure out what went wrong. So why would these groups of people even want to work together? Jez Humble said, a fundamental assumption of DevOps is that achieving both frequent, reliable deployments and a stable production environment is not a zero-sum game. And this was, I believe, one of the keys to understanding the movement and how popular it was. In the old way of thinking about things, it was a zero-sum game. If the developers won, it meant that the sysadmins lost. If the developers got their frequent, reliable deployments, getting their code out f quickly into production, it meant that the servers were probably going to catch on fire because they didn't, the developers didn't bother to test their code and everything was going to go wrong and it was going to be terrible. From the other side of things, the sysadmins thought that if, if they got stability, that meant that things couldn't change, that things had to remain just the way they were, just right. Don't look at the servers wrong. So it's easy to see why this idea was so popular. Next in the hype cycle is the peak of inflated expectations. At this point, there have been quite a few success stories about a technology. Maybe a few failures, but not ones that have really deterred people from, from thinking about this or trying to try it. As these stories make their way around, some companies will take action and decide that they should do DevOps themselves, but others don't. As one would expect, big corporations tend to be a little slower, more hesitant to implement a change like this than smaller companies, and especially startups. I'm not sure exactly where it started, but sometime on the internet, the idea came around that we had hit peak DevOps. This was sometime in late 2013, probably early 2014. By this point, it had been a few years since DevOps was invented. Everyone knows what it's about. We've all heard the word before. There have been over 30 just DevOps days conferences all over the world. And bigger conferences are starting to add DevOps tracks, like the Web Operations Conference Velocity or the Large Installation System Administration Conference LISA. Everyone is starting to talk about DevOps. We've all heard the successes of well-known places like Etsy that really got DevOps right, and stories of people who tried to do DevOps and failed. But it's still, you know, we've hit peak DevOps. Everyone is talking about it, and people still really think that this is a great idea and it's going to be the answer to everything. DevOps-related jobs are everywhere. If you search for DevOps on any major job board, you'll find hundreds of, of postings. If you have DevOps on your resume or LinkedIn, you'll have recruiters contacting you weekly, if not daily. Part of the reason that I took DevOps off of my job title was to cut down on recruiter spam as kind of an experiment. It cut by about 90%. The number of recruiters just contact me out of, out of the blue saying, let's talk about DevOps. You can be a DevOps engineer or a DevOps lead. You can even be a sparkly DevOps princess. I mean, if people are getting tiaras, you know that this is kind of a big deal. Or maybe that people have stopped taking it so seriously. 
And that leads us down into the next part of the hype cycle, which is the trough of disillusionment. At this point, enough of people have tried to do the DevOps and failed that it's, it's lost its kind of magic appeal where people think that it is going to be the answer to everything. And these failures might come for different reasons. Maybe it was an environment that was you know, just too big to change quickly enough and people you know, gave up. Or maybe they just didn't understand what it was that they were trying to accomplish. Some people are just tired of hearing the word DevOps used or misused and decided they've had enough. The community at large was kind of feeling this way as well, especially among people who had seen it since 2009, seen it from the beginning, who had followed along with its growth for all of these years. And it was something that grew very, very rapidly from that one little conference in Belgium into global movement. You know, the hipsters who were doing DevOps before it was cool, they were kind of over it already. And so people started writing blog posts and giving talks about this. Stuff like, you are not a DevOp. There is no such thing as a DevOps team. Or even, DevOps in your job title is doing you harm. And the numbers on these slides I have linked to the various materials that I've referenced here. They're all very good talks, very good blog posts. I'd, they'll be at the end of my slides, which I'll post later, so I'd really recommend reading them. DevOps in your job title is doing you harm. Part of the reason that I took DevOps engineer off of my resume and off of my LinkedIn was because I was tired of the recruiter spam. Also, a title like DevOps, it makes it sound like you're the sole owner of something that should be owned by everyone. When my Twitter says, sparkly DevOps princess, it's because it's more to make fun of people who think that DevOps is just this magical fairy dust that you can sprinkle on things. Puppet Labs put together a great blog post highlighting some of what they thought were the best or perhaps worst uses of the term DevOps. Like the VP of DevOps will be responsible for everything DevOps related, like creating silos, or having some good buck passing skills. We only use this in DevOps. We use a different tool in production. Because apparently DevOps is not an idea. It's some environment, like staging or testing, that's totally separate from production. Because, you know, that makes a lot of sense. So when I say that DevOps is dead, what I really mean is that DevOps is in this trough of disillusionment right now. I'm sick of hearing about it. So are a lot of other people. It's become a term that has been misused or used in so many different ways that it's started to become meaningless. It could be configuration management, release management, agile, the, the cloud, it's web scale. It, it, it could mean anything. You keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. So what's next? The slope of enlightenment is the part of the hype cycle when it becomes more widely understood how a technology or idea can benefit the people or the companies that are trying to adopt it. So, developers and operations people working together. What else is there to really understand? It's not that complicated, right? I would argue that when we're talking about DevOps, what we're really talking about or what we should be talking about is empathy. Empathy is the capacity to recognize, to understand, and to share another person's feelings and experiences. Empathy allows a developer to understand why stability is important to a sysadmin, why it matters to them that the site doesn't go down all the time. And empathy allows that sysadmin to realize why being able to deploy the code that they've been working on is important to the developer. Empathy is what allows people to work together. Jeff Susna actually wrote an excellent blog post about this a few months ago that speaks directly to this. And if there's one thing that I've linked in these slides that you should read, it would be this one blog post on empathy. He wrote that empathy allows software makers and operators to help each other deliver the best possible functionality and operability on behalf of their customers. And I think that phrase, on behalf of their customers, is what's really important here. 
Because after all, aren't our customers the people that we're ultimately thinking about? He also said, you can't design anything truly useful unless you understand the people for whom you're designing. This takes empathy one step further, outside of the company, to, to the people that the company is trying to help with their product or their service. I mean, how many products have flopped? How many startups have failed? Because somebody had an idea that they thought was good, but they didn't understand the problem, they didn't understand their target audience well enough to make it actually succeed. At Game Changer, our target audience is the people involved in amateur sports. It means the players, the coaches and scorekeepers, and their friends and family who are, care about the results of their games. We have everyone at the company talk to, meet, interact with our customers on a regular basis so that even those of us who don't have a sports background understand what it is that we're trying to do and the people that we're trying to help. I'm not really a sports person myself. I don't really understand the ins and outs of baseball statistics. It turns out there's a lot of them and some of them are very complicated. But I do understand why it's helpful for a coach to have stats generated automatically instead of having to spend hours after every game doing it by hand. And I understand what it means for a grandfather to be able to follow along with his grandson's little league baseball games when he's stuck in the hospital and can't make it to the games himself. On the front wall of our office, we have a poster with our company values. A lot of time and thought and effort was put in to creating these values, to making sure that they reflect what we want them to reflect. And the first one is customer first. It says, listen, be empathetic, stop and ask yourself, will this help our customer? Our CEO said to us, after he put this poster on the wall, I've never believed that words printed on a wall will create a strong culture, ensure business success, or win a championship, for that matter. And these words are no exception. But I do hope that they can be a subtle reminder of the principles that we hope will be the foundation of a company that makes a positive difference in all of our lives and the lives of our customers. And that's what empathy is about. It's really about culture. We talk about tools a lot when we talk about DevOps. But the best automation, configuration management, release management, you know, the fancy new text editor that you have to have some beta invite for because Vim wasn't good enough, these tools cannot fix a broken culture. It doesn't matter how many shiny new features your latest Office chat program has if people don't actually use it. Tools can't make people talk to each other. It can't, they can't make them listen to each other. This can work in a good way or a bad way. We'd probably all agree that project management and bug tracking are good things, but if every single team at your company is using different bug tracking software, how much collaboration is really actually gonna go on if every tool is different? Tools can reinforce trust and empathy between teams, or they can be used to kind of demonstrate their absence. I've been on teams where the developer said, well, we don't want the QA team to have right access to our JIRA, because then they'll just add bugs, and that'll be more work for us, and we don't want them to tell us about bugs, because, you know, our software is infallible. You know, you're lucky to use it. I've had teams that didn't even want other teams to have read access to their, to their JIRA, to their Trello because I don't even understand the logic for that. They were so paranoid about other people knowing what they were doing. For whatever reasons, that was a culture without trust, without empathy. And even though they called themselves DevOps, there was not a lot of DevOpsing going on in that kind of thing. So how do you measure DevOps? How do you know if you're actually doing it right? For software development, Joel Spolsky invented the Joel test, you know, 12 questions so software developers can, you know, figure out how good, how productive the environment is that they're working in or going to be working in if they're looking for a new job. Tom Lee Mincelli put together the operations report card, kind of a similar idea for system administrators to gauge 
how well they were doing in terms of operational best practices. So maybe somebody needs to put something together that's similar for DevOps, like a few key questions to gauge how empathetic your company culture is. I'm not sure exactly what those questions should be. They're probably a little more complicated than how many pull requests or how many deploys you have per day. But maybe ask questions like, who is involved with planning? Does planning consist of just a few executives sitting in a room closed off and they make decisions that just come down from on high to everyone else? Are, or are the different product teams, the people that interact with the customers, are they the ones that are helping to plan things as well? How much time is spent interacting with the customers? Do you even talk to the people who are using your product? So I don't know all of the questions that we should be asking, but maybe there's some benefit to be gained to f to, from figuring out what those questions are. Bringing it back to empathy, empathy allows you to view teams, other teams as enablers rather than blockers. In the old view of things, other teams were very adversarial. And if you haven't read this book, I would recommend Gene Kim's book, The Phoenix Project. It's a very good story of a company that started out in this kind of, oh, the devs hate the ops and the ops hate the dev kind of view of things. When things are bad, teams view each other as trying to get in each other's way, as if the ops team's goal is not to like, operate the site or anything, but simply to keep the developers from doing their job, which obviously isn't the case. If you view the other teams as enablers, you're asking, how can we work together to accomplish what we're trying to? Operations isn't trying to block forward progress. They're just trying to make sure that the platform, that the site is deployed on, is stable so that the customers can actually enjoy it reliably. It doesn't matter how many shiny new features you have if the site's down. So the last phase in the hype cycle is the plateau of productivity. This is when an idea starts to really take off, when its applicability and relevance are really clearly understood. We started out with the peak of inflated expectations where this new idea was magical, where it was going to solve all of our problems. And then we realized that it wasn't magic, that we'd have to actually you know, put some work into this instead of just sprinkling fairy dust on it. Now we need to figure out what we can actually do to make this work. When we can take this idea that, that we've seen, that it's started to mature, and use it to really make things better. So we know what we want is a culture of empathy and understanding. What productive steps can we take to get towards that kind of culture? It's not enough to just talk about it. Talk without any meaningful action doesn't do anything. That's the kind of places who decide to rename one of their teams. It doesn't really matter which one. They rename that team the DevOps team. They call it good, and then six months later, they're like, why did nothing actually change? So what can we do? What we can do is stop creating DevOps teams. DevOps is about culture, and for that reason, it doesn't make sense to have any one team, especially any one person, be responsible for it. One person on their own, even the CEO, even the vice principal of DevOps, whatever you're going to call them, cannot change an entire company's culture. They can help, they can lead by example, but they cannot force people to change. Cultural changes have to be a collective effort. They need to have buy-in throughout an entire organization if they're to succeed. It can't be just one team. If we're talking about DevOps as the idea of development and operations working together, it doesn't make sense to have just one team that's responsible for working together. I mean, shouldn't all of your teams be doing that? DevOps is about tearing down the functional silos that we had in the past and replacing them with trusting and empathetic relationships between teams. And it's important to remember that there's more silos that an organization can have than just development and operations. Any team can become a silo in the wrong environment. 
We talked about tools. Tools can be used to either enhance silos or to prevent them. It's about adding or removing visibility between teams. If operations has visibility into what development is doing, they know what features it is that they need to be running, that they need to be supporting. I've been in a position where, as an operations engineer, something went down, and somebody came and yelled at me about it, and they said, why is that mobile site down? And I said, what mobile site? Because nobody had told the operations team that there even was a mobile site that we were supposed to be monitoring. Visibility between teams can prevent that sort of catastrophic lack of communication. This can be especially true when you add teams like sales and marketing into the mix. It's important that they understand what it is that the developers are working on. It's important for the operations team to give them visibility so that the ops team can say, oh, hey, heads up, you know, we're having a problem with this one feature. So that it's not a surprise when customers might ask about it. The DevOps movement started in large part to try and solve the problems and dysfunctions that came from having isolated functional silos within an organization. Functional silos make it easier to pass responsibility out of them onto another silo, onto another team, than it is to encourage people to take responsibility for themselves. Taking responsibility, instead of a culture of just passing the buck to someone else, can take a lot of different forms, depending on your product, your culture, the size of your organization. But as a first step, consider something like simply putting the developers on call. Not necessarily for everything, but for the parts of the site or the app or whatever that they are working on, that they are developing. We did that at Game Changer, and after a couple weeks of being on call, the developers really understand why unreliable software that wakes you up at 4 in the morning is a bad thing to have. It increases their visibility, their understanding of what it means to actually run software in production. It's easy to say sometimes, oh, well, you know, I'll just write the code. Done with it now. It's not my problem anymore. But when, when it is your problem, you want to make it better. You care about quality more when it's waking you up at 4 in the morning instead of somebody else. Have developers and QA work in the same environment when, when they're developing that you have in production. It seems like common sense, but I've seen too many places say, oh, they can write the code on a MacBook, even though we're you know, running on Linux in production. You're not, you don't have your MacBooks in the data center. You need to make sure that responsibility is taken so that these environments are, are the same thing, so that you know that it's going to be the same environment. And when the inv developers inevitably do get paged, or the ops team, you know, whoever is getting paged, but preferably both, functional team, we switched to cross-functional teams just a couple months ago. And the reason for doing that was that it increased the idea of responsibility for something. So we have a team that lasts you know, between three weeks and about three or four months for a specific project, for a specific feature. And so at this point, it's really easy to say, you're done being responsible when the feature works in production. Whereas with, with silos, with non-cross-functional teams, it was, it was kind of harder to say, okay, when's the line when it's done? Because, okay, the developers finished writing the code. Is that done? Well, if it doesn't work in production, it's not done. So with cross-functional teams, the idea of done becomes a little easier to define. Hi. Uh, thanks for a very nice talk. It was very inspiring. Um, so I'm an assistant professor, so I'm a, from an academic background. And uh, my question for you will be, uh, going back to the education, uh, what, what, what do you think the role for the education uh, could do with respect to this uh, uh, change in the culture? And what could be done uh, with respect to uh, perhaps improving the skills for system administration that perhaps are not part of the curriculum in most of the computer science uh, universities? Yeah. Um. I'm not sure about education in terms of, you know, what could we do with a four-year degree or, you know, even a two-year degree. That would be a lot harder to change. There are a couple things. That, uh, one that comes to mind is called Ops School, 
which is a wiki that a bunch of people in the operations community have put together with the idea of teaching operators, system administrators, a variety of the skills that they need. Um, the other thing that I really like for kind of teaching new system administrators is just grabbing, you know, someone who's really junior, someone who's fresh out of college, they might have a CS degree, they might not. But the key is to, you know, get them interested in operations because, I mean, I don't know, apparently I'm one of the few people who really likes, you know, oh, figuring out why the server doesn't work. But, you know, it's, it's kind of fun. I describe it like Legos for adults. You get to play with the server and put all the different pieces together. And if you do it right, you get, you know, something functional at the end. So finding somebody with that kind of drive and just pairing with them, you know, working with them because I think, you know, academics, like in terms of a degree, it's, you, you don't get so much of the required working with people. I mean, none of the projects that I did in school, even group projects, really helped me that much. It was actually getting to work on, you know, a product that went into production that taught me more. Really, really, really great talk, thank you. Thank um, you. One of the things you touched on that uh, hit home with me is uh, alerting fatigue, and that's a major problem in my company. And it, it makes sense that uh, distributing the pager to more people um, makes everyone more aware, but are there any other techniques that you, or tricks for reducing that fatigue uh, and adjusting the alerts? Is there any kind of group process that you use? Yeah, um, one process that we have for reducing the alert fatigue was to pretty much get rid of all of the alerts, because the alerts that we had, they'd built up over time, you know, months and years of, oh, somebody decided that this was a necessary alert. So what we actually did was just get rid of all of them, bring back the ones that we knew that we needed, like, you know, is the site down? That's pretty obviously one. And then just bring them back as needed, because that way you figure out what you need to be alerting on now. We also do the same thing with postmortems. We say, okay, in addition to all the you know, technical stuff, what, what went wrong, how was our alerting on this? Did it alert us enough? Did it alert us too much? And we'll adjust from there. Any more questions? All right, if people have questions later, you can find me on the internet and I have you know, everything here for further and even further reading. I will post these slides later if people are interested. Thank you.